record straight. First, let's refresh. So we're talking about how species in one ecosystem impact one another. Um, adding or subtracting one species can really change an ecosystem. Why? How are they all connected? Why, when we pull on one thing in nature, do we find it pulling on everything else? How are they connected? Often through what kind of relationships? We could all sing it together. Symbiotic. Nobody wants to sing with me? No. Well, okay, Gavin, I get that you don't, but maybe other people want to sing with me, so don't speak for them. Um, there's this entire network of symbiotic relationships in nature. Um, every single species connected to probably thousands of other species, if we really get the details right. These are the kind of things that you probably want to write down or, you know, make notes about, not just the blanks on the slide. You know, every single one species has got all this other stuff pulling on it. And so far we've talked about the predator-prey relationships, which you know really well. We talked about parasitic relationships. We talked about competition, competitive relationships. And here's what I want to ask you. And you're going to talk about this at your table for a moment. Which is a bigger deal in the world? Competition or cooperation? So, talk about it at your table for a minute. Interestingly enough, um, there's disagreement here. I have a few tables that, that just said, oh, it's this. It's competition. Oh, it's cooperation. I have a few where people within the table don't agree. And I have one that's actually still having an ongoing dialogue, which is fantastic. Um, because, you know, even if you think it's competition, you might say, well, but then what about this? And play the devil's advocate. Poke your friend's point of view. That's discussion. So compete, cooperate, compete, cooperate. Um, this is a question that has honestly been asked in biology for a really long time. Which drives ecosystems more, competition or cooperation? It was <laughs> the old line, um, sort of what I grew up hearing, was that it was all about competition. The struggle, nature, bloody in tooth and claw. It's all about competition. It's this, you know, vicious race for survival. We're starting to think that might be completely bogus. <laughs> um, what's really fascinating is especially, I would say in the last 20 years, um, biology has really changed its understanding of these relationships. Um, what changes scientific understanding? New information very often. What gives us new information? Who here has ever encountered new information in their lives? Every single day. Oh my God, if you, have, if you do not have your hand up, I am assigning you homework. I'm going to send you out to get a flood of new information downloaded straight into your brain. Um, I don't know how that will work, <laughs> but I'll figure it out. Um, a lot of that new information has come from new ways of observing, new ways of thinking, new questions that have been asked, um, and just different brains. There's, well... <laughs> we'll talk more about it later. But, you know, really predation and competition and parasitism, um, to some degree, I, I kind of like grouping those three together because in e what do those three have in common? Talk to one another. What do those three have in common? In every instance. I'm going to give you my take on it. So as much as I said I hate the whole, like, everybody gets a trophy, in predation and parasitism and competition, there's always a loser, isn't there? <coughs> I mean, in a predatory relationship, somebody gets eat. Somebody gets et, I guess I should say. Someone gets et. Someone dies. In parasitism, somebody is being actively harmed at the expense of somebody else or something else. And in competition, somebody aces somebody else out or somebody moves over a little bit so that they don't have to compete. But somebody always has to give ground somewhere. So that really is all this side, even though some of those are not direct competition, but they're all sort of, I don't know if they're zero-sum games where, you know, if you lose, I win, if I lose, you win. But, you know, there's a loser for sure. Ask the bunny and the coyote who won. Oh, yeah, the bunny can't say anything, it's dead. Um, Spoiler alert. 
On the other side of the coin, we have types of symbiotic relationships that are more based on everybody getting benefits out. So let's look at that. So we're going to start off with mutualism. This is one that you did not do. So mutualism is a cooperative relationship where both species get something out of the deal. Everybody gets something out of the deal. And the common example that's given is bees and flowering plants. Really, you could put in any pollinator there. Um, there are flies that do pollination. Did you know that there are flowers that smell like rotting meat? There's a, there's a plant called the carrion flower, and its flowers smell like rotting meat. Do you know what pollinates it? Flies. Flies which are attracted to decomposing meat and will land on a carcass will land on the carrion flower and like go diving down into the flower only to be disappointed to find that there is no rotting meat. But in the process, they get covered in pollen and take it to the next carrion flower. Pretty cool. Um, ants and aphids are one. I said that there are ant farmers, and there are actually a number of species of ants and aphids that do this. The ants protect the aphids like a little farmer with their little herd of tiny miniature six-legged cattle. They will move the aphids onto plants to feed. They'll actually like herd their little aphid bugs. And so the aphids feed on the plants. Aphids um, have piercing sucking mouth parts. They have a little needle they stick in the plant. They suck up plant juice. And what they can't use, they sort of pee out these two little spouts on their back. Oh, I can't remember what the spouts are called now. I used to know this. Eucalyptus. And, pardon? Eucalyptus. No. And um, the, the ants actually drink the liquid that comes off the aphids. It's amazing. <laughs> it's really cool. There are some mutualistic organisms in this room. Humans and, Plants. and what? Plants. Um, oh, all of them. All of those. Fantastic. Good job. All of them. So let's talk about humans and plants. Are there any plants that we have multi-generational relationships with that we get benefits from and they get benefits from? Yes. Yeah. yes. Every plant that we've domesticated. Every single plant that humans have domesticated. Now, did the plants give something up for that? Yeah, they gave up a little bit of freedom. <coughs> They're not reproducing, you know, on their own in the wild, willy-nilly, helter-skelter. But we're making special places for them to live and reproduce. We are chopping down the weeds around them to reduce competition that they have to otherwise undergo. We're making sure that they get enough water and fertilizer and everything else. We're taking care of their needs. And in exchange, we get fruit. They get their genes passed on. We save their seeds and plant those seeds again and again. So yeah, every plant that we have domesticated is involved in a mutualistic relationship with us. Who said bugs? Bugs, okay. So let's talk, what's a bug that we have a mutualistic relationship? Multi-generational, interspecies, everybody benefits. Honeybees, yeah, we could go with ladybugs. We'll go with them next. Honeybees. We said honeybees. Are they native to this continent? No. No, absolutely not. We brought them over on ships from Europe. Um, they're a European import. What do the honeybees get out of that deal? We get delicious honey. We get our crops pollinated. What do the honeybees get out of that? Land. Land. We expanded their populations globally because we brought them to a whole new continent. Um, we set up nice special little places for them to make honey and make babies and eat and grow and live and reproduce. Yeah, they're getting their genes spread all over the globe. Every place honeybees have been taken is sort of new territory for them as a species. That's a benefit. Ah, well, you know what? Maybe next time. Um, what other, who said bacteria? Where do you have bacteria in your body? Everywhere. You guys are so well trained. Um, you got bacteria on your skin. You got bacteria in your mouth. You got bacteria in your entire digestive tract. Mouth to anus is covered in bacteria. Um, it is. And without that bacteria, guess what would happen? You would die. You would die. Die. Um, 
You have to have those bacteria. They are helping your body process nutrients. They are actually, I mean, we're finding out crazy stuff about the microbiome. Do you know the stuff about mental health and the microbiome? They're finding links to the contents of your microbiome in your gut and depression and anxiety. Are you crazy? That sounds completely insane to me. But they're finding that there, there's good evidence that the contents of your microbiome, your gut bacteria, seem to have widespread chemical effects throughout your body. <coughs> what do the bacteria get out of this deal? So you got, you got bacteria living in your gut. What do they get out of it? Talk amongst yourselves. Could we sum it up as three hots and a cot? They get a place to live. They get food to eat. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. It's not a bad deal. I heard a few people say nutrients, a place to live, a chance to reproduce. All of that. All of that. It's a huge benefit to their species. Now, there are species that are so dependent on the thing that they're in, in mutuality with that if one species disappears, the other one goes extinct. What would, so there are species of bacteria that only live in human guts. What would happen if tomorrow humans went extinct? Those species of bacteria would disappear too. Oh, we're kind of like little arcs for a bunch of bacteria. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gives you a whole new feeling about your guts, doesn't it? No, is that just me? Okay. Um, we're, we're carrying rafts of biodiversity in our guts. You're like a whole planet full of bacteria. Some of you are still alarmed by this, I can tell. <laughs> Mutualistic relationships always benefit both parties. Now, here's the weird part. Last class of symbiotic relationship we're going to talk about, commensalism. In commensalism, one species benefits and the other is not harmed. And we saw one example in the Yellowstone video on wolves. Wolves and wolf kills are a really common um, example of a commensal relationship. Same thing happens in Africa with lions and vultures. So what lions don't clean up from a kill, the vultures will come along and pick the bones clean. Um, you have... <coughs> Um, you have barnacles that attach themselves to whales and as far as we can tell it doesn't harm the whales in any way and as far as we can tell it doesn't benefit the whales in any way um, they're kind of like meh whatever the interesting oh you were arguing about this with your mom mm -hmm. I love biology arguments at home we have them all the time um, but yeah there are a lot of relationships that we used to think were commensal that the more we understand the more we think they're actually mutualistic. So, once you've finished copying that, I want to draw you a picture. Impossibly tall trees. Insanely tall trees. Trees the like of which we don't commonly see here. Maybe you know where you find impossibly tall trees commonly? California. Pacific Northwest in general. Um, the redwoods. The sequoias. Like seriously impossibly tall. One of, my, one of my bucket list items is to go sit next to a giant sequoia for an entire afternoon and just hear what it has to say. Um, I don't want to sit next to a tree that big. So here's the interesting thing. How many of you have heard the expression, bumblebees can't fly, they just don't know that? <coughs> you heard that? Supposedly, you know, they always say, oh, you know, if you look at the engineering on a bumblebee, they're physically incapable of flight, but they do it anyway. That's a total load of BS. Um, it's, it's one more of those lies you've been told. It's not true. No, they're perfectly capable of flight. You can look at the physics of it and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's a nice inspirational thing. That's what it's, it's aimed for. Like, the bumblebees can't fly, but they do it anyway. You can do it. Yeah, whatever. I prefer to use actual real um, examples for that. Well, these giant trees shouldn't exist. They should not be capable of getting that big. What's interesting is that all along the west coast of the US, and it's really the only place in the world this happens, we have, um, we have these mega trees, these enormous trees. And I've seen them in Oregon and Washington State. I've never been to the sequoias. Um, 
they shouldn't be able to get that big. And for a long time, biologists didn't even understand why they got that big. Like, what's the advantage? Do you realize how hard they have to work to get water from their roots up to their tops? It's crazy. So why would you get that? I mean, usually there are serious advantages to being just the right size. You know, there's a reason most humans are not 10 feet tall. There's a reason most humans are not 2 feet tall. Like, just the right size really works with our physiology. And for most trees in most of the world, just the right size really works well. So, you know, the first question was, why do these trees get this big? And the second question was, wait a minute, that shouldn't even be possible. They shouldn't survive, let alone thrive, into old age. And the number one problem for why these trees shouldn't exist is nitrogen. Now, you watched the nitrogen cycle film for your blizzard bag, right? Yes. How many of you finished that? Okay. All living things need nitrogen. Um, what, I don't think it talks about it in that film. What component of all living, so what's, okay, talk about this at your table, don't shout it out. What is one chemical that every single living thing on the earth uses? And every single living thing on the earth needs nitrogen to build this molecule. Talk. Once we set aside the mystery of how they can even exist, how they can even get enough nitrogen to build their bodies, there is an entire <laughs> bunch of crazy people. If you ever want to read a really um, wonderful, nutty, sciencey book, there's a book called The Tall Trees, and it's about basically, how would I sum them up? Nutbag amateur biologists who like big trees and climbing things. How to make a life out of climbing tall stuff. Does that appeal to anybody here? It would have, to me, at an earlier age, my, my sense of heights has gotten funkier as I get older. Would you like to climb 400 feet up a tree? Yes. Who here would do that? Gavin would. Luke would. I would not anymore. <laughs> at one time, I would have. Not now. So this book is about these crazy people, um, some of whom didn't start off as biologists, who started climbing these trees. Here's what they found. Once they got up into those trees, they basically found a whole world that they didn't know existed. They found like blueberry bushes growing 300 feet off the ground up in trees because in the crotches of these trees, yes, that's what they're called, where those branches come together, stuff falls down and it decomposes and it forms soil. So there were places up in these trees <coughs> where there were like three inches of soil. There were whole little weird microscopic gardens living up there. There were soil bacteria in that soil. And even more importantly, if you ever, ever, ever get a chance to go to the Pacific Northwest, I beg you to do it. Somebody ever says to you in your life, hey, you want to go to Oregon? Say yes. Hey, you want to go to Northern California? Say yes. Hey, you want to go see Washington State? Just say yes. Just go. Walk through those forests. They are the coolest, weirdest, spookiest, most awe-inspiring forests I've ever seen. And one of the weird things about them is that most of the trees are hung with lichens. It's very moist out there. And there are these also, along with the soil and the little miniature blueberry bushes and the three inches of you know, decomposed matter, there are lichens hanging off all the trees. <laughs> There were species of lichens that had never been identified. The one woman who's detailed in the book um, Tall Trees made a name for herself, and she didn't even, and she had like maybe a bachelor's degree in biology. She, did, she was not a PhD, she wasn't doctor anybody, um, because she started climbing these crazy tall trees. <laughs> and she, she discovered like six <laughs> new species of lichen in a couple of years. She was basically an amateur who liked to climb things. <laughs> And what they figured out, so we used to think that the lichens were a commensal relationship. Yes, this is coming back around. Um, we thought they were a commensal relationship. What did they get out of it? They got a place to live. They got up into the air. What did the trees get out of it? Nothing, but it didn't hurt them. What they discovered as they started exploring these ecosystems and they, they call them um, canopy ecosystems because there's actually a whole different ecosystem up there. What they discovered is that these lichens are fixing nitrogen. Oh. 
because lichens are actually a symbiotic organism. Lichens are a combination of three things. They're an algae, a fungus, and a bacteria, all living in one body, essentially. And there are lots and lots and lots of species of lichen, though, in fact, like I said, there are three species, every single one of them. Those lichens have bacteria in them, which are capable of fixing nitrogen out of the atmosphere. They're fixing nitrogen into forms that can be absorbed through the trees, trunks, and branches. Without those lichen, so we used to literally think that the trees were getting nothing out of this, they were just tolerating it. And what we now know is without those lichen, these giant trees literally could not exist. Whoa, that's kind of cool. So what you're going to do, and I'm going to give you the last, what is it, 15 minutes here to get a head start. I'll upload the assignment. You've got two things to do. Number one, you're going to look at mutualistic and commensal relationships for your organism. Number two, you're going to pull out your vocab packet, look at parts A, or look at part C, see if there are any things that you can start to fill in with examples as of now. What, what's, is, is there, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to do anything, but like, is there, would, would teachers punish you if that happened? Would you get in trouble? I, I mean, I'm just going to make fun of you and dance to your ringtone. I was told I was okay. supposed to, but I don't think I figure it's an accident. It's happened to me, too. <laughs> oh, it's my superpower. Um, so anyway, this is, you know, this is a, a sort of, what do they call that? Folios lichen, because it's leaf-like. And then you have these stringy lichens that aren't, that don't look like leaves. They look like, I don't know. Some of them are called old man's beard because they look kind of like beards. And you can actually see there are multiple different lichens in that picture. Like these are lichens. These are a different species of lichen. Um, yeah, so now you should be on the lookout for it. But those are either commensal or mutualistic relations, depending. Okay.